What do you think it'll take to get the paparazzi to leave you alone? Um, I don't know. Why do we love to watch women fall? That night was not a good night for her, but it was a good night for us because it was a money shot. This is the question that haunts 2021's Framing Britney Spears as we watch the stages of Britney's fall from grace in fast motion. From the slut shaming to the mental health problems gleefully captured if not triggered by a predatory paparazzi, to the highly suspect conservatorship that controls her finances and person to this day. Britney's father so far has refused to step down. So how and why did we let this happen? She said, I don't want anyone touching me. I'm tired of everybody touching me. Britney burst onto the scene in the late 90s as a new kind of sex symbol. Her persona was a contradiction, a hypersexualized schoolgirl, a naughty girl next door, a sexy virgin. On the one hand, you're a sweet, innocent, virginal type. On the other hand, you're a sexy vamp in underwear. I wouldn't say in underwear. And perhaps one reason she captured such global fascination is that this contradictoriness is inherent to teen girlhood. She just captured that dichotomy so well of what a teenage girl is. Teenage girls want to be adult women, but they also are kids. But because of this, Britney also became a target of moral panic, as if she were causing young girls to desire to be sexy, rather than reflecting a world that already oversexualized young girls. Britney's trauma illuminates three factors which converge to produce a strikingly misogynistic moment. The dawn of famous for being famous culture with its obsessive focus on celebrities' private lives, the height of the tabloid's dark power in a pre-social media world, and the lie of post-feminism, which falsely pretended that systemic sexism had been vanquished. Here's our take on the story Britney Spears' loss of control told about us and whether or not we've truly moved on from this oft-repeating, misogynistic, fallen woman soap opera. The main thing that people became fascinated with was her sort of unraveling. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to get notified about all our new videos. I want to thank Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. Skillshare is an incredible online learning community made up of millions of lifelong learners. The first 1,000 take viewers to use the link in our description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. So check it out now and start exploring your creativity. To understand why people felt threatened by Britney, we have to look at what she represented to them. The 90s pop culture narrative was all about girl power, from the Riot Girl era of the early 90s to Buffy the Vampire Slayer to the Spice Girls. Girl okay. power is about being individual, being whoever you want to be, right. wearing your short skirts, your wonder bras and your makeup, oh, having something to say right. as well. Starting with Baby One More Time's release in fall 1998. Baby One More Time. Britney channeled that power and embodied a striking bodily confidence that drew both male and female fans to her. But the biggest difference between Britney Spears' pop stardom and the women who came before her was the specific kind of sex appeal she embodied. Madonna may have sung about being touched for the very first time, and the Spice Girls alluded to practicing safe sex on Two Become One. But Britney was explicitly a kid and was being marketed toward kids. I was feeling pretty good about my um, Barbie doll, and then I saw the six new Britney Spears dolls. Britney's appeal was not just sexuality, but an emerging or blossoming sexuality, and implicit in that was a youthfulness. I think a lot of people were, like, uncomfortable with you know, her sexuality. She was described as jailbait with a Lolita aesthetic. A lot of talk about your sexy Lolita look. While the 90s feminine ideal was already all about flat stomachs with the emaciated heroin chic fashion trend, Britney took abs of steel to another level. As Taffy brought us her acne rights in Cosmopolitan, Britney's abs became the abs we aspired to. I want to know what kind of sit-ups you do. I want you to teach me those sit-ups. The popularity of this particular body ideal gave rise to fashion trends like crop tops and low-rise jeans, all designed to highlight a young, almost prepubescent looking body type. Britney's records sold because actual young girls, as well as guys, liked her appeal. But at the same time, there was fear and discomfort around kids emulating her. Kids made Britney Spears. 
and then she remade them in her image. I can't help that, and if the parents don't like them to see it, then change the channel. Victoria Sands writes for Bitch Media that Britney and singers like her were considered fetishistic ploys who blended innocence with eroticism, subsequently corrupting their young audience. And the media capitalized on this fictitious moral panic. Personally, I think it's fantastic. <laughs> But if I had a little girl, I wouldn't want her to emulate Britney Spears, you know, if she was like 12, 13. These little girls start looking up to her because she is like this cute little teeny bopper. Then all of a sudden, boom. Britney was trapped into paying lip service to a rather puritanical idea of young female purity, what Jezebel's Hazel Sills describes as the purity movement of the time, which was driven by evangelicals and had support in the highest reaches of government. Despite her highly sexed up music videos, in interviews, Britney was advised to speak about her chastity and virginity. Yes, I am a virgin, and I definitely want to try and have sex till I'm married. Even while she maintained a high profile relationship with Justin Timberlake. Are you re really happy? Of course, man. Look at her. I know, she's lovely, isn't she? She's, a, she's well, an 11. But the contradictoriness of Britney set her up for failure. There was no way she could successfully continue to portray both a Madonna and a whore archetype in one package. How do you feel about all the constant speculation about your virginity and whether you are a virgin or not? <laughs> I really wish I would have never said anything. Some of her contemporaries got off lighter because they more decisively picked a lane. Christina Aguilera, whose sexy teenage debut single was even less ambiguous than Baby One More Time. Said that her saving grace was never claiming virginity. Christina Aguilera, what's what's the big deal when I do it? I think everybody always thought you had a different relationship to young girls. Jessica Simpson went the other direction, leaning further into the chaste, virginal, anti-sex appeal persona. And there's that one thing that, that I want to share with my husband. Still, these other stars never quite matched Britney's heights of fame and influence, which inevitably made her a target. Looking back on the aughts, it's clear that this was an exceptionally misogynistic era. And we can understand what happened to Britney through the intersection of three key phenomena. First, as reality TV became mainstream, audiences became more used to peeking behind the curtain and increasingly expectant of the intrusive coverage tabloids provided. Well, there was always a, a little bit of a hunger for the unposed photographs. As we had more of that kind of material in the magazine, you know, the sales just went um, up. In this time, we saw the birth of famous for being famous culture, exemplified by Paris Hilton, who became a household name without a traditional entertainment career. Secondly, in a climate where the internet had growing influence but social media hadn't allowed celebrities to take some control of their narratives, the dark power of the tabloid press was at its height. I was the f photography director of Us Weekly for about a decade. When I had a really healthy budget, it'd be $140,000 a week on imagery. Gossip blogger Matt James called it a perfect storm when the internet, gossip magazines, blogs, and the tabloid press worked together to create a society that was fixated on celebrity in a way that it had never been before. There was too much money to be made off her suffering. Third, the treatment of Britney and those who followed soon after her reflected the after effects of post-feminism being popularized in the 90s. In the post-feminist view, the women's movement was declared to have achieved its goals in the 70s and 80s. The inequality women previously faced was declared to no longer exist, which made it pretty difficult to have tools to confront misogyny when it still happened, which it obviously did. Who do you watch, the nice girl? The pretty girl you can take home to mom? Or the cheap slutty girl you know puts out, everybody goes for Monica! In the 90s and aughts, slut shaming was so taken for granted. Did you see Monica's new hairdo all slicked down with that hair gel? At least I think it was hair gel. That a woman couldn't call out this practice. She could only defend herself as an individual by trying not to get labeled this way. Ever since the sex tape scandal, I have to be really careful at how I'm perceived. People are going to say like, oh, you know, all she's good for is taking her clothes off. How to get control over your own life. That's why I am where I am today is because I do have control. Framing Britney Spears challenges the prevailing narrative that Britney was just the mindless product of a pop music machine, reminding us that her success as an artist came largely from her personal drive and agency. She was very creative. She was the one who 
knew what she wanted to do, and she would make that happen, or her people would make that happen for her. In fact, it was Britney's control that was precisely what fans sensed in her and wanted to emulate. It isn't the sex part that seems cool. It's the control and command over herself and her space that seems cool. Entertainment Weekly's oral history of Baby One More Time reveals that the concept for the iconic video was Britney's idea. The concept is like taking place at a school. It was kind of my idea also, and it takes place at a school, and the kids can't wait to get out of school. The video's director, Nigel Dick, recalls thinking, I'm being told by a 16-year-old girl what I should do. But this girl is 16, and I'm a grown man. Perhaps she has a better perspective on her audience than I do. It's striking that the Baby One More Time video also isn't mostly focused on a girl trying to be sexy for a guy. It's full of sequences of Britney leading groups of her peers in advanced choreography and impressive athleticism. Yet, while she may have had more control than many assumed as Britney the artist, Britney the sex symbol and Britney the celebrity were another story. Shaved her head, attacked the paparazzi, more custody drama. Thank you, Britney Spears. Being bad is good for my business. As the focus turned increasingly on the superstar's life and womanhood instead of her work, we can see how control was stripped away from her. This culminated in her eventual conservatorship, where control of her life, her finances, and her decisions was concretely taken away from her. The court gives someone else special powers to make decisions for them. It's unusual because Britney is so young and productive. On the other hand, in the cut story, Britney Spears was never in control. Tavi Gevinson argues that framing Britney Spears overstates the amount of control Britney started with to serve its narrative arc. Gevinson writes, It is absurd to discuss her image from that time as though there was not an apparatus behind it. As though she existed in a vacuum where she was figuring out her sexuality on her own terms. Those are a little much. And I didn't have approval over the thing, so that's one picture. I must say, that I felt kind of weird about. She observes that the documentary is eager to characterize Spears' early image as an expression of female power rather than the corporation-sanctioned sexualization of a 16-year-old. And in the article, Gevinson's friend Leia identifies Britney as a commercially manufactured reaction to the Alanis Morissette angry woman persona of the 90s, who arguably better empowered girls to explore their own feelings and be less male-facing. So as tempting as it is to view Britney simply as an extension of 90s girl power who was punished for being openly sexual, that's also oversimplifying. It overlooks that she was a naive underage girl being marketed as a sex symbol and tricked into photo shoots that sent a message she didn't understand when she was 16 and, quote, didn't really know what the hell I was doing. The very end scene in the video on Slave where the guy licks my face, I didn't know he was going to do that. Perhaps the deepest truth about the moral panic around Spears is that she got blamed for being a victim who reflected, rather than caused, the routine sexualizing of underage girls which was happening in her culture. I noticed last week you had the most adorable pretty eyes. Do you have a boyfriend? What's clear is that whatever creative control Britney did assert over her music, her image, her performances, this was chipped away at every step of the way. Her artistry was devalued. Accusations of lip syncing followed her throughout her career. In sync Britney Spears, why did they even have mics on? In their review of 2004's greatest hits, My Prerogative, NME wrote Spears does artifice far better than she does soul, and that her major talent is that of self-objectification. Part of her life where she did feel like she had control was undermined, and the part of her life where she didn't became everything. You have to realize that we're people, and that we need to, we just need privacy, and we need our respect. And the headline is, cover up, Lindsay, we can see your knickers. Of course you can see your knickers. Your photographer is lying in the road, pointing this camera up her dress. The cycle of building a woman up only to very publicly kick her off her pedestal predated Britney and continued after her. What are they rehabbing, first of all? What, what is on their list? <laughs> what, are, what are they going to work on when you walk through the door? We didn't discuss in the, this in the pre-interview. Psychologist Joanna Constantinopoulou argues that part of our desire to tear celebrities down is to do with the rarefied position they occupy, saying, People with fame shift into a different realm for us culturally, and this causes us to believe that it's okay to treat them differently. Critics, they'll put you on top for a minute, but then they'll drag you down. They'll get sick of you and they'll destroy you. They hate you, see, because you made them love you. 
This is especially true of famous women. As author Sadie Doyle writes, as long as they also live out impossible female ideals, they're useful, as something that other women can aspire to and fail to become. But if they're remotely unruly, if they're flawed, if they're in any way recognizably human, all of our discomfort with female visibility comes to the surface. She needs to back off and put a pair of blue jeans on, no shoes, and just sing. The fallen woman trope goes all the way back to Eve in the Garden of Eden, and from Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter to Verity's La Traviata to Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. We can easily see a common theme. The fallen woman breaks with her society's sexual norms. So that all men may know you are guilty of the sin of adultery and shun you with an evil. In the Victorian era, the British Library writes, Fallenness was associated with a downward spiral that began with sex and led to loss of social position, ruin, and death. Likewise, one of the major catalysts for Britney Spears' fall from grace was Justin Timberlake's reveal that while they were together, she was not a virgin. Did you Britney Spears? <laughs> yes or no? Oh, man. Come on, man. Okay, I did it. As well as his casting her as the immoral woman through his implication that she had cheated on him. The way that people treated her to be very high school about it was like, she was the school slut. If Britney and other fallen stars in recent decades could be accused of anything, it's breaking the rules of their contract with the public by revealing that they were more complicated than whatever trope they were initially cast as. Britney Spears can't be the sexy virgin if she's not a virgin. Winona Ryder can't be the fresh-faced ingenue when we see her caught on a department store camera stealing sweaters. The fact of the matter is that she's been treated, in my opinion, anything but like anybody else. The revelations of the Me Too and Time's Up movements have made us look with horror at the tabloid press and confirmed beyond any doubt that the whole idea of a post-feminist society was a damaging myth. It's imperative that we learn from this history and don't let it keep repeating itself. We are no longer going to be harassed. We are no longer going to be mistreated or discriminated against or paid less money. We are going to create more opportunities for each other. But how far have we really come? The reactions to Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion's WAP mirrored the same moral panic that followed Baby One More Time. And if yeah. anyone was to watch that video, you would see that, uh, you know, she acts out very kind of sexually explicit moves. And twerking has become like a fun thing for little kids now. The tragedy of former Love Island and X Factor presenter Caroline Flack taking her own life revealed that the tabloid press remains a vicious, damaging institution, one now aided and abetted by online trolls. Anyone who's ever compared one woman against another on Twitter knocked someone because of their appearance, invaded someone else's privacy, who have made mean, unnecessary comments on an online forum need to look at themselves. The UK tabloids have given Meghan Markle the same old treatment, building her up in order to gleefully tear her down, while adding racism into the picture. Allegations that she's associated true. with very racialized forms of crime. There have been discussions about her exotic DNA. Her newborn baby... Is her DNA not exotic by royal chin. standards? For all the bad social media has added to the climate, there's a lot of good, too. Not least because it's taken power away from the tabloids. Celebrities can at least attempt to control their own narratives and speak directly to their large followings. And the Free Britney movement has shown that fans truly do have the power to be a positive force protecting a celebrity's well-being. We stand up for you, Britney Spears, and we won't stop until you reach freedom. In the end, the biggest lesson in Britney's story is that we owe it to everyone, even the most supernatural of stars, to see them as people and make sure they're treated that way too. I know at some point she will tell her story, and I'm so grateful for when that point comes. This is The Take on your favorite movie shows and culture. Thank you so much for watching and for supporting us. Please subscribe and never miss a take. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. Skillshare offers thousands of affordable classes designed to fit your schedule with short video lessons that you can pause and come back to at any time. One Skillshare original you can check out right now is Brian Jackson's class on digital music production. Jackson is a world-renowned electronic musician, audio engineer, and producer who will familiarize you with Ableton Live, a uniquely powerful audio software, so you can start producing top quality music. Right now, Skillshare is offering our viewers a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. But that's only if you're one of the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description below. So join today and jumpstart your creative journey for less than $10 a month with an annual subscription.